Hello everyone, my name is Alvaro Lozano Robledo and this is a video on SAGE or SAGE Math which is part of my course on computations and number theory research which is offered for CTNT 2020 which is offered completely online this year. Okay, um, so today we're going to be talking about SAGE, SAGE Math which is a free open source mathematics package that uh, builds on other open source packages such as maybe you've heard of Maxima or Gap or R and it also has a lot of their own libraries uh, and specifically number theory is a very useful package of mathematics so I'm just going to go over a few of the commands that number theorists uh, like in, in Sage. Uh, Sage itself is based on Python so uh, if you've learned any Python before then sort of like the programming on Sage is um, it will be more natural to you uh, Sage is uh, its mission, as it says uh, right here, is creating a viable free open source alternative to other packages that are uh, not free or open source, such as Magma, Maple, Mathematica, and MATLAB. And I think they do a pretty good job at that. All right, so there are two options to uh, use uh, Sage. You can download it in your own computer, your own machine. I'm, I'm showing uh, in this video my own version downloaded in a PC. Or you can actually use uh, Sage Online via their CoCalc instant uh, Sage worksheets. CoCalc itself is a virtual online workspace where you can do Sage, but you can do other things like LaTeX, uh, Linux, Octave, Python, R, and many other uh, tools online. But in particular, uh, you can run Sage uh, worksheets. I, I recommend that you create an account on uh, on CoCalc, if you're going to use it, I use it when, when I'm not on my home computer, just so I have a, a Sage at my fingertips on my laptop when I'm uh, just on the road. Um, you can start uh, also CoCalc without uh, an account. So if you start CoCalc, then you go to something like this, and um, you can start a Sage worksheet. You could start other types of worksheets, but if you start a Sage uh, worksheet, then starts a kernel and then you can start doing math on, on, on this uh, copy of, of Sage. Um, by the way, um, while well, well, the kernel loads and computes 5 plus 8, um, I, I will be putting all the links uh, that I'm uh, showing in this video. They will be at the uh, bottom of the video, in the description of the video. I'll add all the links there so people can uh, explore uh, these packages on your own. Okay, so again, CoCalc is great because you don't have to install uh, a local version of Sage, which is pretty heavy, some few uh, gigabytes. So if you don't have the space, then you can just use it online. All right, uh, how do you learn how to use Sage? There is uh, several sources uh, online where you can find, uh, find out how to use Sage. Uh, I like this book, uh, The Computational Mathematics which, with Sage Math. Um, by uh, all these many authors. You can actually find it linked, uh, linked out of the Sage Math website. Or you can go to the source and look at the Sage reference manual. It's easier to learn from the book than from the reference manual, but the, the reference manual is also very useful uh, when I'm working and I don't remember a particular uh, parameter or a particular uh, um, command, so I, I look it up uh, pretty often. Okay, so let's get started with Sage. What I have here is a, um, I've opened up uh, Sage in my computer and I started a, a kernel already and now I have a worksheet where I'm going to be showing some of the commands that are uh, very useful for number theorists. All right, so let's get started. Uh, you can do basic arithmetic in, in Sage, by the way, to evaluate some command uh, you you write um, uh, you you do shift enter to evaluate it. Uh, if I do enter, I can write more lines in one single command. I can talk about the rational numbers. So if I write QQ, that's the rational field. I can also write uh, rationals to denote the rational field. Uh, you see that the parentheses are because some um, many commands take some sort of parameters. Uh, so the parentheses, inside the parentheses, we would write the parameters. I'll show you some examples in a moment. I can also talk, about, of course, about the integers. 
Oh, here's the integer ring or integers like that. Great. And uh, if you need to, uh, some number theorists, sometimes we do have to talk about the real numbers. We can write our R for the real numbers. And you see that this uh, real numbers are stored as decimals. So it comes with 53 bits of precision by default. But I can change that. If I write uh, reals 100, then it knows that I'm trying to change the precision of my real numbers to 100 bits of precision. I can also talk about the complex numbers. And, of course, as number theorists, we're very much interested also in finite fields. So a finite field, uh, I'm actually going to call it uh, by, uh, with this command, gf7 would give me a finite field of order 7, of size 7, with 7 elements. I can uh, call it in several ways. So, for example, I can, um, uh, I can call this field k and then uh, a generator of k um, you would call in this way. So I uh, a here is a number uh, 1 in the field. Um, I can also uh, predefine what I'm going to call the generator. So for example, if I want to uh, talk about a field of 13 elements, then now I have b at my disposal. And I can uh, think, for example, so b here would be 1 modulo 13, and I can try to invert, for example, 5 times b. That would give me uh, 8. OK, we check that 8 times 5 is 1 modulo 13. Uh, 8, times, uh, 8 times 5 modulo 13, that is 1. I can also do it in other ways. So for example, in k2, I can uh, figure out what is 1 fifth and that is uh, the number 8 in the field. All right. Um, other rings that are of interest for number theorists, of course, we're going to need to know how to do polynomial rings. By the way, uh, once you start typing a command, if I press tab, it will open a window of potential commands that are at my disposal, and I can complete it to a polynomial ring, and then uh, figure out uh, I have to choose a, a field or a ring uh, where my coefficients are going to live. So uh, there I'm going to make polynomials over the rationals. And those are my polynomials. And then I can do things like talk about polynomials over the rationals. So for example, x squared minus 1, I can uh, factor. Um, I can factor the polynomials uh, like so. Very good. Um, if I change my ring, then factorization will be in some other ring. So, for example, if I talk about polynomials, uh, polynomials over GF13, a, a field with 13 elements, then uh, because 13 is a prime that is 1 mod 4, minus 1 is a quadratic residue, minus 1 is a square, modulo 13, so the polynomial x squared plus 1 should actually be able to uh, should factor of the variable is y. So uh, let's see if, if that polynomial factors. And there you go. It factors over the field with 13 elements, and the roots are minus 5 and minus 8. Very good. Um, what else can we do? Uh, other things that are of interest is, for example, that uh, the matrices. So uh, groups of matrices are very important number theory, in particular SL2 over the integers is a very important ring. So we might want to talk about it and about matrices. For, so for example, I can define two matrices that are actually uh, generators of my matrix group. Matrices, once G is defined, matrices are defined by, um, by quadruples, like so. So I can talk about the matrix. Um, 1, 1, and 0, 1. Let's look at them. So here is A, and here is B. And uh, and then I can compute things like A times B times A inverse in my group. And I get some new matrix that is also in SL2C matrices with um, integer coefficients and determinant 1. Very good. What else? Uh, we are interested in integ integers modulo a number. So, for example, I can define 
uh, the integers modulo 100. And in this ring, I can talk about, um, uh, for example, I can call a b a seventh, and then see how much is a seventh. That's 43 because uh, 43 times uh, 7 modulo 100 is 1, so they are multiplicative inverses of each other. Perfect. Okay. Uh, of course, we're interested in the primes. The primes, the prime numbers in Sage are this set, primes. Uh, so if I call uh, the primes, uh, I'm going to call it P, then I can call uh, the C rows uh, prime. So you see that in, in Python say, uh, lists, start with, uh, so the first element of a list is the zeroth element of the list. So you have to be careful and always call if you want, the first element in that list is going to be P0. So the first prime is two, and if I want to know what is the hundredth prime, then I'll have to look at the 99th element in that sequence, and I can just, uh, I'll just figure out, uh, see how many primes are there. There's a lot of primes already stored in Sage, so I don't have to pre-compute um, they, they are pre-computed for me, so I don't have to do a lot of work like that myself. Very good. Uh, if you want to um, talk about a range of numbers, because we're going to do some iteration soon, uh, I can do those uh, like so. So that's the range uh, 5. So for example, let's see what numbers are in there. So for i in range 5, uh, let's print the number. Uh, so that, you see, I just did a, a return without shift return, so I can write a second line, and it indents, uh, it knows to indent, uh, so let's print i, and then it prints uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So the range from 0 to 5 is actually the numbers starting from 0 up to 5 minus 1. All right, so let's, for example, do a loop. So I find out the first few uh, Sophie Germain primes. So Sophie Germain prime is a prime p such that 2p plus 1 is also prime. So let's, uh, uh, let's do that, for example, for i um, uh, in range, uh, let's say, up to 100. Uh, let's call p be the p prime and then q be uh, 2 times p plus 1, and then if q is prime, uh, then uh, what's going to happen is that I'm going to print uh, p, and I'm going to say uh, p is a Sophie Germain prime. So let's see what happens. It spits out right away. A lot of Sophie Germain primes, so the 3 is a Sophie Germain prime because 3 times 2 plus 1 is 7, which is prime, so 3 is a Sophie Germain prime. Fantastic. By the way, this, uh, this worksheet, I will also put it somewhere where you can get it, so there will be a link in the description of the video to this worksheet itself, so you can uh, um, copy and paste the commands if you want, or look at it in an easier way than looking at a video again. All right. So, uh, by the way, you can you can do lists in other ways. So the same list of Sophie Germain primes we just created, it might be easier, more convenient to have it as a list. So I'm going to call it. It's going to be primes in a range, uh, and it's going to be in this list if. Uh, so gonna, we can put conditions if this prime plus one is also prime. Okay, so that should give me a list, uh, L, uh, of the primes that we saw before. So you see it started with 2 and 509, and this list starts with 2 and 509, like before. And then I call. I can call, let's see, which is uh, the 13th Sophie Germain prime is 179. Very good. Um, Sage uh, has a, a very nice feature over Magma, which is that I can plot things. So I can plot graphs. For, so for example, I can do the graph of sine of x between minus uh, pi and pi. Let's see that. Uh, and here is a nice graph of sine of x. I can, uh, I can put more things in my graph. So for example, I can graph also a circle of radius 1. Let's, uh, we have to give the center of the circle, the radius, and, uh, and that's it, I think. There you go. Now we have a nice graph of 
uh, sine of x and the circle of radius one in the same uh, in the same graph, you might want to change the color of the circle so it's easier to identify that these are two different graphs. So I can add one more instruction to some one more parameter, which is some color, uh, some different color, uh, so RGB color number. Uh, for red is that, so I can change the color of my uh, graph. We'll, we'll come back to this. I'll grab uh, an elliptic curve in a moment. Okay, so why don't we start then uh, doing some more advanced number theory. So let's go into number fields. Let's uh, again uh, define a polynomial ring that is going to allow me to talk about um, extensions of Q. So I have the rational, but now I want the number field. I want an extension, uh, a quadratic extension of the rationals that contains I. So for that, I would have to extend by uh, I. So I'm adjoining a root of x squared plus 1 to my number field to Q. And then I'm going to get Q adjoin I. Okay, so here is now k is q adjoin i, and i is the generator of the uh, number field. Okay, so that um, I can now do arithmetic with this i, i squared is minus 1. And uh, for example, 3 plus uh, 2 times i times uh, 3 minus 2 times i is 13. So the number 13 factors in the rank of integers of q adjoin i. The ring of integers, by the way, I can uh, denote it by k and then call the ring off. I can uh, tab, and uh, that's the only command that is available. So it completes that to the k uh, to the ring of integers of O, and I can uh, figure out what are the generators of my ring of integers. So once I compute a ring of integers, it automatically computes generators in terms of the generator. Uh, of the of the number field. Oh, by the way, um, when I use my um, Sage at home, uh, I can't return two different things. So like like that. So I'm going to do a vector uh, with first generator and second generator. See if that works. Yes. So the generators of my ring of integers are one and i, and uh, so those are uh, that tells me that the ring of integers is z and join z and joint i the Gaussian integers. Okay, um, let's look at another ring of integers that is a little bit different. So for example, I can do the ring of integers. Uh, let's first uh, define a number field, um, x is square plus 3. So I'm adjoining the square root of minus 3. Sorry that I'm not a fast typer here. Um, and then OF is going to be uh, the ring of integers. of f, and then let's see what are uh, the generators of these ring of integers. 0 and of 1. Oops, dot 1. So you, now you see that it's not longer true that 1 and f are the generators of the ring of integers, because as we know, the ring of integers of q adjoined the square root of minus 3 is not just z adjoined the square root of minus 3, it's z adjoined a third root of unity, so it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, I can define the same number field in another way. Uh, so if I can define instead, I'm going to define it as uh, by this polynomial, then actually uh, the generators are now 1 and f. Okay. Um, there, there are other commands in Sage to actually find out better polynomials for the field and so on, but I, I won't get into a lot of the specifics right now. Um, we can do extensions of number fields. So now that I have the, the ring of integers of uh, the ring of integers of um, of the Gaussian the Gaussian integers, which is O, remember, I'm going to use O to extend. So I'm going to first to extend the number field, I'm going to define a polynomial rank over the number field, in particular over O, which is z adjoin i, the rank of integers of the Gaussians. And, uh, and then I'm going to extend the number field k by this polynomial. 
So what I'm adjoining now is a square root of i. And if I look at L, now L is a polynomial, also it's a quadratic extension of the uh, Gaussian integers or the Gaussian rational numbers of q at j and i. But this L is a relative extension, so you might want to uh, create it as an absolute extension of q. So let's call it uh, LL, and it's going to be the absolute field. Um, and that should give me a field now that is uh, a field, a number field defined over q, uh, which is of degree 4, because it was before we had a quadratic extension and a quadratic extension of that. So in total, I get a quartic number field. And uh, I can compute all sorts of invariants and, uh, and things that are related to this number field. By the way, um, a couple things that I, I didn't mention. So for programming, when we did uh, loops, uh, the pages on programming from Sage are pretty good to learn how to do different types of uh, programming and loops and, and things of that sort for cycles, while cycles, and so on. And the other thing that I wanted to look at is now that we know about a number field, um, there is uh, my first video of this series was on the LMFDB, which is a database on um, objects of a number theoretic nature. But in particular, it has a uh, it has nice connections to Sage in that I can get code here uh, from an LMFDB on how to compute things in Sage. So, uh, for example, in number fields, I can look up my number field we were looking at, x to the 4 plus 1, and uh, find it, and then see, And well, here you can find all these invariants, but if you want to learn how to find these invariants using Sage, then you can do download SageMath code, and then uh, SageMath code is going to give you all the things that you might want to uh, figure out about a polynomial, or about a number of fields. For example, this tells me uh, how to find an integral basis or how to find uh, the invariance of the class group or so on. So for example, um, let's, uh, let's figure out uh, what is the unit group of this quartic field. So I can, um, I can figure out what is the unit group and then I'm going to uh, find what are the fundamental units of my unit group. Let's see if that works. There is one fundamental unit and it's u squared plus u plus 1 where u was a generator of the absolute field and where u is a root of x to the fourth plus 1. There you go. All right. So what else, uh, what else can we do? Um, we can also talk about Galois groups. I think that's something also that probably was there in the LMFDB. I can uh, define G to be the, uh, the Galois group of K. So let's do the Galois group. And, um, and that's G. And then I'm going to find out, for example, is G, uh, what, kind of, what kind of group is it? Let's see what the Galois group is. So it's a group of order 4, and uh, is it a billion? It better be, yeah, because it's order 4, true, it's a billion. Uh, there are two a billion groups of order 4, it can be cyclic or, uh, or decline 4 group. So let's see if G is, um, is cyclic and false. So it's the Galois group of uh, Q adjoined the square root of I, is um, is a decline quartic. Uh, it's a, a decline for group Z mod two cross Z mod two. Okay. Um, by the way, what we constructed is actually a cyclotomic field. So I can call a cyclotomic field in another way. So I can define cyclotomic fields directly. So what is the cyclotomic field of the eighth with the eighth cyclotomic fields so or the eighth roots of unity? And uh, I'm going to check if C is uh, isomorphic to the field that I called LL. Yes, those two fields are isomorphic. 
uh, it's the the one we constructed by a square taking a square root of i is the the eighth the cyclotomic field of the eighth root of infinity the eighth cyclotomic field all right other things of interest for number theorists are the piatics so the piatics uh, this is how you field uh, how you build a piatic ring uh, for, for example the seven attics uh, I would build uh, ZP and then say the prime and the precision I'm going to build it to 20 digits and uh, and then that's it that's uh, the seven attics and I can work uh, seven adequately uh, for example, let's call it, uh, let's see what is in the seven addicts. Three is invertible, so I can try to figure out what is the seven attic expansion of one third. And it gives me the first 20 digits of the, of the fraction one third as a seven attic integer. I can also um, not just talk about the seven addicts, the integers, but of, uh, I can talk about the rational um, numbers the, the piatic rationals um, for seven so um, how do I do that that would be QP again seven and precision being 20 and then I can talk for example not just about things that are integer like a third but I can talk about things that are not integers in the um, in the seven addicts but it will still give me an expansion and then now you see that uh, it is not an integer we need a um, and you to invert seven to be able to talk about the expansion, but that is the expansion of uh, one over twenty-one. I can do, um, I can talk about polynomials and factor polynomials over the uh, piatics. So, for example, I can now define a polynomial rank over the seven addicts and uh, figure out whether perhaps 2 or the square root of 2 is a 7 attic number so let's see if I can figure out that so here it is it does factor so x squared minus 2 factors over the 7 attics and it gives me an expansion the first 20 digits of the expansion the 7 attic expansion of uh, square root of 2 great so let's, uh, as number theorists, we're also interested in arithmetic geometry. So we're interested in arithmetic properties of curves and uh, rational points on curves. So let's talk about some geometry. I can define, uh, first of all, affine spaces. Affine space. I have to tell it what is the ground field. So let's start with the rationals. And then once I have an affine space, I can create curves. So I can create curves as uh, I can put a list of polynomials here in X and Y that will define a curve in the plane. I define the affine space that I define as dimen two dimensional. So it is a plane. And I can, for example, define um, a hyperbola, I think, in this case, over the affine space A. And I can, I can look at A. Okay, let me see if maybe this will work. Yeah, I can plot it. Uh, this is the hyperbola that I'm talking about. Fantastic. I can also uh, check if my curves are smooth. So is C, uh, is it smooth? Are there any singularities? Yeah, this is a, this is a conic. So it is smooth. Um, and I can try to now change the field. I can do, um, I'm going to call it A9 now, UV is going to be the affine space over GF9 in two dimensions, and that is, uh, I can also again define my curve the same way, the same hyperbola, um, minus y square minus 1, over this now I find space 9 and I can talk about uh, the curve again I made a mistake somewhere um, oh you see I used the variables for the affine space over Q and I didn't like that uh, so 
Um, the, the error messages are sometimes a little confusing here, but many times they're informative enough that I can figure out what the problem was. Okay, so you see now I've defined over a field of nine elements, I've defined uh, a curve, uh, and now I can do things, for example, I can count the points on this curve, because it's now over a finite field, so I can actually fi figure out all the points over this field. Uh, this parameter 1 means that I'm going to find the points over the field, of the ground field. There are 8 points. If I change it, uh, if I, instead of uh, 1, I write uh, 2, then what it tells me is uh, the number of points in the ground field and the number of points in the a unique extension of degree 2 over the ground field. Since the ground field is GF9, the extension of degree 2 would be GF81, uh, so that's what it's telling me. Okay, so if I did it this in another way, let's just call this 81, uh, and then I try to count points over the ground field, then it gives me 80 now because now it's computing over the field with 81 elements. Very good. Um, sometimes we like to talk about uh, the curves in projective coordinates. So that I can actually projectivize uh, my, uh, my curve, like so, and I can find the projective closure, or I can talk directly about projective spaces. Let's call uh, P9, uh, it's going to be uh, the space, uh, the projective space, whoops, the projective space, so projective space over, let's say again, then GF9, um, two dimensional because it's still uh, the projective plane, and uh, the projective curve uh, is going to be the curve now. Um, let's call it, and I'm going to just do the, the projective closure of the curve I've talked about above. So what u is square minus v is square minus w is square would be its projective closure living in p9. And uh, then I can also count the number of points, count points on this now projective curve. Let's see what happens. I have 10 points. Before over GF9, uh, remember I had 8 points. Over GF9, now I have 10 points. What happened is that now we're talking about projective space. So we're looking also at points at infinity. So when W is 0, then I have 2 points. 1, 1, 0, and 1 minus 1, 0 are two new points that are, um, that are in my curve. By the way, I can list my points. So I can list for, um, for curves over finite fields. I can list all my points, and here they are. Okay, uh, I think that's ten points. Great. All right, let's uh, let's move on to elliptic curves. Um, so an elliptic curve is uh, a curve that is um, uh, of projective smooth of genus one and with at least one point over its ground field. And uh, they're conveniently, they conveniently have what we call a Weierstrass equation. So this is an elliptic curve uh, with Weierstrass coefficients 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. I can also do, I believe, if I do just um, A and B, so uh, 4 and 5, then uh, the elliptic curve is in short value stress equation, so that just denotes the 4 and 5, which over Q, every elliptic curve can also be written in a value stress short equation. Okay, um, I, can, I can plot elliptic curves if you want to look at the uh, real locus of the elliptic curve. I can plot it like that, and I can plot points, and it's nice to plot points and then do uh, the lines that, uh, that are involved in the addition of points. I leave that up to you to learn how to do that. And um, I can also define elliptic curves over finite fields. Uh, elliptic curve. So, for example, if I, as soon as I put a, one of the coefficients over a finite field, then it's going to identify the entire thing over a finite field. So I can say 
gf1, and then 2, 3, 4, and 5, and then see uh, what is this e. So now this is the elliptic curve we defined before, but now the field of definition is uh, the finite field of size 5. Very good. I can also, uh, something that is um, very interesting, is that I can define elliptic curves. As I said, an elliptic curve is a curve of genus 1 that is projective, smooth, and has one rational point. So any plane cubic that is smooth can be uh, put into a Vajastra's equation using Sage. So for example, I can uh, define an elliptic curve from a cubic like follows. So for example, I can um, I can uh, define it. How about x cubed plus uh, y cubed? Oh, I should probably give you um, a coordinate system first. So let's call this x, y, z. Uh, this is going to be a projective space over the rationals, and it's a plane. And then I'm going to call E is going to be the elliptic curve. It turns out that the uh, the curve um, x cubed plus y cubed equals 2z cubed is uh, non-singular, so I can use that as a cubic. So that is um, a smooth cubic, and it has a point. Clearly, 1, 1, 1 is a point, so I'm going to write that in projective coordinates and see what happens. It gives me an elliptic curve, and it already returns it as a bias stress model. So there is an isomorphism between x cubed plus y cubed equals 2 equal, uh, equals 2 z cubed, and y squared minus 18 y equals x cubed minus 108. Fantastic. Uh, I should be able to also figure out what is the isomorphism, the scheme morphism from one to the other. So um, what I can I can do that is uh, like so. I can actually call it f is going to be um, this, but instead of elliptic curve, I'm going to call it elliptic curve from uh, cubic. I believe this is how you get it. Uh, this, this, and then what I actually want, instead of the elliptic curve itself, I want the morphism that is going to give me the isomorphism between uh, one elliptic curve, the the one in the cubic, and one um, and one elliptic curve in via stretch form. And here it is. So now f is the morphism, and it gives me from two and the definition of the morphism. This is what the morphism is actually doing. By the way, conveniently, you can find the inverse morphism, so you can go from uh, points on this elliptic curve to points in this elliptic curve, or vice versa. If you want to find the points on this elliptic curve, you can send them over to the other elliptic curve. That's very useful, in my opinion. All right, so um, I can also call elliptic curves from uh, their uh, common labels. So for example, uh, the elliptic curve Uh, 577A1, that's a Cremona label, and it knows what curve I'm talking about, and that's a famous elliptic curve because it's um, uh, what's called the Gauss uh, elliptic curve. So if you go to LMFDB, uh, let's go to the homepage of the LMFDB, that elliptic curve is highlighted here. Um, this is the elliptic curve I just found, uh, 577A1, uh, 5, 5, uh, that elliptic curve is the, uh, is the elliptic curve with the smallest conductor of rank 3. So if I go back to my Sage uh, notebook, I can actually figure that out. What is the rank over the Mordelve group is 3. And like before, in, in LMFDB, I can find a lot of the code, uh, SageMath code, to find all sorts of um, invariants and things related to the elliptic curve. For example, I can find um, what is the special L value of the elliptic curve, which is related to uh, the Burton-Sheraton-Dyer conjecture. We'll, we'll do that in class, I'll figure out 
uh, if the virtual certain dire conjecture um, holds in this case, meaning at least numerically we're going to identify uh, the two values. All right. Um, what else? So yeah, so you can find all sorts of commands that are useful through um, through the LMFDB for elliptic curves. So let's let's finish up. I don't want to take too long in this video uh, by uh, computing modular forms. So uh, Sage is great for uh, modular forms computations. So uh, in this way, modular forms 11 precision uh, 20, I can compute the space of modular forms uh, uh, of level 11, and I can uh, um, I can I can find the basis of these modular forms, and it gives me that there are uh, the basis is uh, there are two elements that are basis elements. Fantastic! You can see that. Uh, this Q indicates that this is a cusp form, while this is not a cusp form. So if I compute the cusp forms, the cuspidal subspace, uh, I can compute uh, those cusp forms, and again, compute a basis of the cusp forms, and there's only one. There it is. I'm going to call it F uh, for now. Uh, let's call this cusp form F, so it would be as basis, and it would be the zeroth element of the basis. Uh, let's see it. There it is. All right. Uh, by the uh, Taniyama Shimura conjecture, which is now a theorem of over Q, this modular form, there's a cusp form, level 11, weight 2, should correspond to. Uh, an elliptic curve. The, there is a way to construct um, uh, elliptic curves in the modular form attached to an elliptic curve such that these coefficients have something to do with the number of points. So this coefficient here has something to do with the number of points, modulo 3 of some elliptic curve out there. Um, so because there is only one cusp form of level 11, it must correspond to a isogeny class of elliptic curves of Conductor eleven. So let's let's find an elliptic curve. Uh, Cremona labels that number is the conductor, and a one means a is the first isogeny class in level eleven, and one is the first elliptic curve in the isogeny class in the first isogeny class. So let's see. There should be just that one. Um, that there should be only one isogeny class because there is only one cusp form at level eleven, and then. I can figure out um, the um, the Q eigenform. Let's look at the Q eigenform of the elliptic curve, uh, and that is not uh, the command that I was looking for. Um, I thought it was uh, precision. Oh, okay. So let's let's give it a precision. You see. It says, yes, I was missing the precision here. Fantastic. Thank you, Sage. Here it is. And then you see that it coincides the Q form, the Q eigenform that's attached to the elliptic curve, and the unique cusp form, um, well, then not the unique, there's, there's a, uh, it's a one-dimensional space, but the unique with that starts with uh, a normalized expansion, they coincide. So uh, that's how we found it. Okay, how about uh, something a little more interesting? Let's see what happens when we go to level 26, for example. So if I do S is uh, the cusp forms of level 26, then uh, let's give it a precision of 20, and let's look at the basis. How many cusp forms are there? Now there are two cusp forms. Of level 26, or the um, the basis is uh, there are two, so it's two dimensional. Great. Uh, then there must be two different isogeny classes at level 26. Uh, conductor 26. So let's call them 26. Uh, let's call it a1, and then there must be one at level. Um, another one, there must be something in a different isogeny class. Okay, let's look at them. Uh, so what is E1? 
that's the one, and E2, that's another one. And then I can compute their eigenforms. So F1 would be E1 Q uh, eigenform. Uh, let's give it a expansion. And uh, F2 would be uh, the one for uh, the second elliptic curve. Also degree uh, of with 20 coefficients. And uh, let's look at them. So here is F1 and here is F2. Uh, you can see that in the space that we had, uh, neither one of these basis elements are these ones. However, uh, I'm going to be able to, these have to be in the space of cusp forms. These eigenforms have to be in the space of cusp, cusp forms. So uh, let's call it uh, G1 is going to be the first basis element of my cusp forms. And G2 is going to be my second basis element of the cusp forms. And let's see how much is G1 plus G2 and G1 minus G2. Oops, um, I, I can't do that. So this is just G1 minus G2. And you see that this one corresponds to this eigenform for E1. So this is that and, um, and G1 plus G2 coincides with uh, F2. You see, so we found uh, the eigenforms that correspond to two elliptic curves at conductor 26. We found them in the space of cusp forms at level 26 as the theory predicts. All right, very good. Um, I think that's it. I'm going to stop the video here. If you want to learn more about number theory, if you go to this section of the manual, there is a lot of other um, commands and things that you can do a number theoretically with Sage. And I encourage you to explore more uh, around and um, Sage is very useful and I hope you get to use a lot of it. All right, thank you for watching.